بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so in our last lesson we had discussed the conclusion of the battle of the Khandaq the battle of Ahzab and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used a number of factors to make sure that the Ahzab uh, departed without even a battle taking place. Uh, we talked about Nu'im ibn Mas'ud, we talked about uh, the army that Allah sent, we talked about uh, the treachery, uh, that's not the treachery, but the, uh, uh, um, if you like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, no, the mistrust, I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm talking the mistrust that the three tribes had for each other. Uh, the uh, uh, Banu Qurayza, with the Ghatafan, with the Quraysh, the mistrust is what I was looking for. That they didn't trust one another. They really didn't have the same uh, reasons for fighting. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used all of that against them. And, وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ As Allah says, Allah was enough. Allah sufficed the believers for fighting. وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ They didn't need to fight. Allah was sufficient for their fighting. So, when they woke up the next morning after that terrible sandstorm, literally they saw the entire land deserted. Nobody had remained, all the tents had been uh, uh, overturned, and so it's clear that the, the Quraysh and the Ahzab have left. So, the Prophet ﷺ then departed back home. And some say he went to the house of uh, Umm Salama, his wife Umm Salama, and he had hardly come home and put down his sword when Jibreel came to him. When Jibreel came to him, and this was around Dhuhr time, it was around Dhuhr time. And of course, Dhuhr time is the time of the afternoon nap in that culture and that, and that time. And to this day, many cultures of that climate, they have an afternoon nap. It is the time of complete silence. It is the time of uh, siesta, really, this, the, 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 the concept of afternoon nap. And it's also the time of heat. Nobody does anything in the afternoon. So the process was about to take off his armor, take off his, uh, you know, to relax. And lo and behold, Jibreel comes to him. Ibn Ishaq mentions that he was wearing a turban made out of istabraq, which is soft brocade, riding a mule with the saddle of dibaj, which is, sil uh, which is uh, silk. So uh, Jibreel is coming in the best fashion and form. His turban is there, he's riding his camel, his uh, mule uh, with a, a saddle of dibaj. And he said to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, have you put down your silah, your weapon? So the Prophet said, yes. He has put his weapon, he's about to take his armor off. He said yes. So the Prophet, so Jibreel said to the Prophet as for the angels, then they have not put it down yet. We're still ready from the battle. We have not put it down yet. And I have just arrived with a new contingent, a new battalion. Meaning, you're coming to rest. We are ready for another round. Ya Muhammad, Allah is commanding you to go to the Banu Quraidha. Now this is a command now. Right? Allah is command. Now after one month of tiredness, of mental fatigue, torture, right? SubhanAllah, you're thinking, finally, come home. Not, he hasn't even put his foot in the house, literally. Take his sword and not his armor. You can imagine, he's in, probably unbuckling the sword, putting it up. That's the armor. And then Jibreel comes. You want to rest? The angels are not going to rest. And Allah is commanding you to go to the Banu Qurayza and I am heading out there right now فَإِنِّي مُزَلْزُلُ الْأَرْضَ بِهِمْ I am going to shake the earth for them now. Yeah, I am going to cause a zilzal underneath them now. So the Prophet wasallam knew that the war was not yet over. That there would not be given even a single day. And this is literally the morning of Ahzab, literally. You can imagine. You know, the, the relief and the gratitude and the concept of just relaxing. But no, there's a bigger thing to deal with. And so the Prophet wasallam sent a crier throughout the entire city that uh, whoever hears sh must obey and nobody is allowed to pray Asr except at Banu Qurayza. لا يصلين أحدكم العصر إلا في بني Qurayza. You all have to pray Asr in Banu Qurayza. That's two hours away. There is no time to even relax, right? And this was a severe, direct command and order. لا يصلين أحدك. You cannot pray Asr except at Banu Qurayza. No rest at all. And this hadith, by the way, is muttafaq Ali. Every book of hadith mentions this. is the famous hadith of Banu Qurayza, right? That the cry went out around town. No one was going to pray Asr except in Banu Qurayza. 
Now, quick tangent here before we get back to the story. This leads to one of the most interesting fiqh episodes in the life of the Prophet Let's just pause here. The story, let's pause it. An incident happened that deals with fiqh and deriving law. Now, the commandment went out. Obviously, not everybody uh, is going to be able to respond immediately. Maybe a few of them have already fallen asleep. Maybe a few of them uh, uh, got the message a bit late. Whatever the point might be. Obviously, some of them are going to be delayed. Maybe a few of them uh, took some time to put it back on and go and, and whatnot. So, they were arriving in Banu Qurayda in batches. They, were, they, they left in batches. The Banu Qurayda is probably an hour uh, walk away, right? So, they're leaving Medina. They're arriving in batches. And some of them, quite a lot of them, trickled in until Maghrib is about to set. Right? So it took a while for them to get the message and to you know, come and do it. Now realize Medina was much larger than it is now. And there are small settlements far outside the city. Not just one large locality. So whatever the case might be, quite a lot of them, mashallah, tabarakallah, they got to Asr before, they got to Banu Qurayla before Asr, before Maghrib time basically. So they prayed Asr at its proper time. But there were quite a lot that were on their way to Banu Qurayla and the sun is about to set. And if the sun sets, Asr time is over, obviously, right? Maghrib time is going to come. So, what happened? The Sahaba that were in this stage of getting to Banu Qurayla, they began to have a bit of a back and forth. Should we pray Asr now? Because if we don't, we're going to miss it. Or should we follow what the Prophet ﷺ said and not pray Asr until we get to Banu Qurayla, even if we miss it? Right? This is now a, an issue here that should we pray Asr right here and now? Because when the Prophet is saying don't pray Asr till you get to Banu Qurayla, it's basically an expression that says hurry up. It doesn't need to be held at literal face value. And he didn't expect that some of us would be in this area, that area. It would take quite a while for us to get there. So if Asr is going to be Finishing, surely we had better pray Asr quickly. It's going to take five minutes. And then we'll get to Banu Qurayla, you know, right after Maghrib. Fine. Or if the Prophet ﷺ said nobody should pray Asr at Banu Qurayla, this means even if the timing finishes, we shouldn't pray Asr until we get to Banu Qurayla. Right? The Sahaba differed back and forth and they couldn't reach a consensus. So what happened? The some of them decided to pray right then and there. And the others said, no, we're not going to pray till we get to Banu Qurayla. So they differed amongst each other. And this shows us that when equally qualified mujtahids make an ijtihad, then no ijtihad is binding on the other mujtahid. In other words, when equally qualified people, now that's the key. With all respect, somebody who hasn't studied sharia is not qualified to perform ijtihad. This is the problem of our times. But suppose somebody is qualified or that the knowledge of this ijtihad has nothing to do with the text of the Quran and Sunnah, but it has to do with the knowledge of the compass, geography, science. For example, which direction is the Qibla? Which direction is the Qibla? Wallahi, the greatest alim in the world who has studied Quran, Sunnah, Sharia, Hadith, but he doesn't know the rising and setting of the sun in east and west. Most of us are more knowledgeable than this alim about the direction of the Qibla because most scholars have not spent their time studying some basic, you know, a Boy Scouts would know more than I would know, right? Boy Scouts would know more than I would know about directions and whatnot. This is not an ijtihad that has to do with the text of the Sharia. You get the point here, right? So when it comes to such ijtihad or even ijtihad that has to do with the text of the Sharia and the person's qualified, he makes an ijtihad then he's not obliged to follow somebody else's ijtihad. Because this is exactly what happened here. The Sahaba are qualified to perform real ijtihad. They made ijtihad. Some of them did this, some of them did that. What happened? They each followed their ijtihad. And they didn't criticize each other. Khalas, you did this, I did that. Right? Now, the Prophet ﷺ, when he got to Banu Qurayla, again, this is the part of the fiqh issue, we'll get to the story again. They told him what happened. And they said, some of us prayed and some of us didn't pray. Some of us prayed Asr before it set. Some of us didn't pray until after Maghrib. So we have Qada basically. We prayed Asr Qada. Qada an. And what does the hadith say? The Prophet ﷺ did not criticize either party. He did not criticize either party. And he let it be. He let it be. And this shows us a very, very uh, profound matter. Uh, by the way, some reports which are weak 
uh, and they are not authentic, he said, both of you have done cor correct. This is not authentic. The correct version, he didn't criticize either. He let it be, right? Uh, this shows us many things. Uh, the first thing that it shows us, apart from the fact that ishtihad is not followed by those who are qualified to be said, the second thing I guess is we, the second thing this shows us is that the truth, the ultimate truth, even in matters of fiqh, is one. How do we know this? Even though the hadith has been used to prove it is multiple. By the way, the same hadith has been used to prove it is multiple. How do we know this? The scholars say, when the Prophet ﷺ gave his commandment, لا يصلين أحدكم العصر إلا في بني قريضة There is no doubt that he would have intended one of the two meanings. He didn't intend both, clearly. It's logical, he would have intended one of the two. He either meant hurry up and if Asr is late then you pray there, or he literally meant pray Asr over there. Number two, the Sahaba, they differed in two camps. There was no third camp that maybe he intended both. Each camp thought they had understood the correct intent of the Sharia, right? Neither of them said, oh, he must have intended both. And it is illogical and frankly against the language against common sense to say he intended both because nobody intends both when you give a command you want either this or that and this is the predominant position in particular of the uh, Hanabila of the Usul al-Fiqh uh, scholars this is an Usul al-Fiqh issue is truth and it's also a theological issue by the way one of the things that the two overlap is truth one or multiple Hal al أو لا? this is a theological and an Usul al-Fiqh issue right is truth one or is it multiple in issues of Fiqh and the position which makes the most sense is that truth is one, but a person who mistakes, uh, who mistakenly misses the truth will not be sinful. Rather, they will be rewarded. Right? So we differentiate between truth and between reward. Between truth and between reward. And this is proven explicitly in the hadith of Bukhari that the Prophet said, إِذَا اجْتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمُ and this hadith explicitly proves that truth is one. What did the Prophet say? If the hakim, literally hakim means a ruler, but it means over here mujtahid. If the judge, if anyone judges, and they're qualified to judge, it's understood. And they are correct, they will get two rewards. And if they are incorrect, they will get one reward. Notice he didn't say they're both correct. You can't be both correct. At any given instance and time for a single person to do a single action, it is either wajib or mustahab or makru or, makru or, or haram or, or mubah. It can't be multiple at the same time. You get the point here. For the same person, the same deed, the same thing, you can have two scholars give two different fatwas. Okay? But in the eyes of Allah, one of them has got to be right. Now, if the mujtahid genuinely made a mistake, what did the Prophet say? If he's mistaken, he'll still get one ajr. Right? And this hadith proves it. That the Prophet did not criticize either of the two camps. Because it's a done deal. Khalas, what's going to happen now to say you were right or you were wrong? Who would benefit? The ones who would be wrong would feel very... And for what? Because this is not going to be repeated. And that's why he didn't clarify what he intended because it's a one-off situation. Had this been a recurring thing, then of course he must have clarified. But this is literally a one-off. There's never going to be a second repeat. There's only going to be one time. Because they misunderstood one of the two, and it's an honest misunderstanding, and there's no point poking or prodding the one that's misunderstood, خلاص, let the matter be. So he didn't criticize either of the two. Right? And... Here we find one of the most interesting and fascinating issues which we still struggle with to this day. And that is, how literal should we be to the text of the Quran and Sunnah? How literal should we be and can we use a little bit of rationality? Or not, right? And this is in matters of fiqh, in matters of aqidah. We believe ilm al ghaib and Allah speaks in ilm al ghaib about ilm al ghaib, so we accept it as it is. We don't use rationality to reinterpret ilm al ghaib. If Allah describes the angels or the Prophet describes adab al qabr, this is ilm al ghaib. Ilm al ghaib, there's no rationality. You simply believe. Samirna wa ta'na. We're talking about laws of Islam. This is fiqh issue here. Laws of Islam. When it comes to laws of Islam, 
there have been trends from the time of the Sahaba and this is the evidence. And these trends continue up until our times amongst the madhahib and amongst modern mujtahids. If the hadith says X, but we kind of sort of understand the reason why X was said and that reason doesn't seem to apply right now, can we kind of sort of relax X? For example, there are so many controversies. Where does one begin? And let's stick with stuff that is classical as well. I don't want to go into the modern stuff, the classical stuff. For example, the issue of women traveling without a mahram. The hadith is very explicit. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day should not allow a woman to travel for three days without a mahram and one hadith for one day without a mahram. Right? But can we say, look, that was a time and a place where you know, there was so much harm, there was so much danger, a woman traveling alone, Allah knows what's going to happen. These days, if you put a, uh, your wife or your sister in the, in the, in the uh, plane and you drop her off at the airport, somebody's going to pick her up at the next airport. You know, that's as safe as it can be. It's not the same as walking in the desert, etc., etc. Can we kind of sort of use a little bit of rationality and not be so literalist in this regard? You have opinions on the whole side, right? You still have those that are very literalist. You say, no, the Prophet said it, and he said it. And others say, well, I mean, he said it, and of course he said it, but there was a reason why he said it. And in our times, that reason, be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, open in this regard. Now, this is just one of literally hundreds of examples that come up. And frankly, this is one of the biggest issues that the fuqaha have to deal with all the time. And what we learn from this incident, brothers and sisters, those who are more literal should not be so critical of those who are a little bit rational and vice versa. These trends go back to the Sahaba. But I have a very big caveat, a very big point to put here. And that is, only those who are qualified to give fatwas should give fatwas. And if reputable scholars differ amongst themselves, then that's reputable scholars differing. The big problem comes, especially, especially in Western lands. Why? Because in Eastern lands, it's impossible for a jahil to rise up. Because there are too many ulama. But in Western lands, when there really are so few ulama, wallahi, yani, mostly the people without ilm are the ones that are at the front of... Uh, gatherings and fatawa and we seek Allah's refuge from being amongst them a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah that we go beyond what Allah has given us of our knowledge but uh, in this in this environment that we're in is very common for people to just read a few things and then yani, mashallah tabarakallah they become Sheikh Google and Mufti Wikipedia uh, but this is the issue that I want to point out that if reputable scholars have a spectrum of opinion Right? And of course, the biggest problem you have in America, you know, I, hate, I do not like this group at all, the progressives and the modernists, that you know, for them, there is no halal and haram. The halal is whatever the flavor is, the month becomes halal. You know, so whatever the culture says is halal becomes halal. They're not qualified to pronounce verdicts, these people. They haven't studied the Quran, they can't even recite Fatiha properly. So they're not qualified to pronounce verdicts about Islam. We're talking about reputable scholars. If ulama who are trained in the field and they have established credentials, and the way that I put this, I know this is a tangent, but Allah is very relevant for North America. The way that I put this, I always say I'm not a doctor, at least of that kind, right? So I'm not a doctor, right? At least of your kind. I'm not, uh, I'm not your type of doctor. Alhamdulillah, I'm a different type now, but not your type of doctor. <laughs> your type of doctor, yes. I'm not your type of doctor, okay? So, suppose, what's your speciality again? Uh, ICU. ICU. Lungs. Lungs, make up your mind. Does he know where? <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So, I see you as lungs. I didn't know that. Okay. Okay, I see you. Khalas. So, speciality is I see you. Okay, now, who has the right to criticize positions you hold? Me, who doesn't know anything about I see you? Or who? Who is I see you? So, you're also I see you. So, you also have established credentials. You also have experience, right? You also have a reputation. Now you come on and say, come on, you can't do this procedure on this patient. Because X, Y, Z. If I come along and say, oh, that looks so weird. You're sticking a needle up here. You're doing that. What is my, my, you see, this is how the progressives, when they criticize fiqh, this is how they sound to somebody who is a faqih. It's like you're not a mathematician. And then you start saying, why is a circle that which has no sides? Who, who said this? Why can't we say a circle has three sides? You see, this is how they sound when they come from out of the tradition. Now, if somebody from within the tradition comes, they know the system and how it works, now criticism is acceptable. 
Right? And this is what we find from this incident of the Sahaba. I know this is a tangent, but it's very relevant. There's a spectrum of opinion. There are opinions that are literalist, harfi. Khalas, this is what the Prophet said, end of story. You know, that's good. It shows iman. It wants, you want to submit. Then there's a position that's a little bit more rationalist. Well, okay, the hadith is there. We accept it. But can we fine-tune it? Is there circumstances it doesn't apply in? And as long as the people who are making these claims are of the tradition, right? Of the, play, the people who are qualified, then alhamdulillah, let, let the scholars talk. The problem comes when outsiders come and they think they know. This is where the problem comes. But this problem of literalism and, and whatnot, we've had it. It's not even called a problem, it's a trend. Rationality and literalism. Yani we have had it since the time of the Sahaba, and this hadith shows us, right? One group said, well, he didn't literally mean make asr qada. He meant hurry up. And we're not able to hurry up, so khalas, let's just pray Asr here, and then we'll, we'll you know, uh, pray Maghrib on his proper time. And the other group said, no, he said Asr, he meant Asr. Khalas, we're going to pray Asr even if it's Qada in Bani Qurayda. It's a classic example of literalism versus a bit of rationality. Ahl al-Hadith, Ahl al-Athar, Ahl al-Qiyas. These are go back to the Madahib, they go back to modern trends as well. And Allah knows best. Uh, if you listen to my fatawa, you find that I am kind of sort of both, you know, I, I, I it's, and this is the way I think is healthy, you, you take from here, you take from there, Allah knows best. In any case, that's the issue of the Banu Qurayza, which is the fiqh issue. Now let's get back to, and by the way, all the fuqaha, when they study Banu Qurayza, this is what they care about it, right? This is the main issue of the Banu Qurayza, and that is, is there one truth or multiple truths and you know what not, this is when they talk about Banu Qurayza, this is that tangent they go into. In any case, back to our seerah lecture for Banu Qurayza. So, uh, so the Sahaba eventually got there of the first to get there because the Prophet ﷺ sent him there was Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali ibn Abi Talib he was sent immediately and the Prophet ﷺ told him to stick your flag outside this is now call for war you are not leaving so Ali ibn Abi Talib arrived with his contingent and he basically put the, the raya he put the flag that we're mean business now and so Ali got there and uh, when they saw him and they saw the flag, Ibn Ishaq says they began yasubun, they began shatim, cursing and vile things about the Prophet ﷺ. You know, the most foul words and he didn't narrate it. It's not about adab to narrate what they said. And he didn't narrate it either. But they started saying the most vulgar things about the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ also was making his way there and he passed by a group of sahaba and he said to them, has anybody preceded us? Who else has arrived before me? And so they said, we haven't seen anybody except Dihya al-Kalbi riding on a white mule. Who is Dihya al-Kalbi riding on a white mule? Jibreel alayhi salam. Right? We only saw Dihya just wandering all by himself in the middle of nowhere on a beautiful mule. And of course, Dihya, as we have said more than once, was one of the most handsome, if not the most handsome of the men of Medina. And so whenever Jibreel would want to, to be seen by the other men, uh, he simply would take on the form of Dihya. So that they knew that there's somebody, but they wouldn't think he's an angel. So he would take on the structure or the form of the most handsome man of Medina, and that is Dihya al-Kalbi. So they said, we just saw Dihya on a beautiful white mule just walking away, nonchalantly past, right? They didn't realize this is, of course, Jibreel alayhi salam. And so the Prophet said, Hada Jibreel. That was Jibreel, that he, Allah has sent him, yuzalzil al-arda min tahtihim, to shake the ground from uh, under their uh, feet. And the Prophet ﷺ arrived, and when Ali saw him, he rushed out to intercede, to intercept him. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you just camp over here? Why? <laughs> Didn't want the Prophet ﷺ to hear the insults. Look at his protection. Why don't we just stay over here? Khalas, I'll set it up for you here. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Perhaps they're saying things about me. Because he immediately understood. What do you do? You think I'm not going to understand what's happening? Like you want me to come all the way here? For what? Perhaps they're saying things about me that are irritating you. So he said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, they are. You know, so he wanted to protect him so much that, you know, stay far away from the, the fortress. I forgot to mention, of course, because every, every Yehudi tribe, they have a fortress. Okay, I mean, I forgot to mention this. The Banu Quraida, like all of the other uh, Yehud of the tribe, they have a fortress that was their architecture, that was their style. And as we had said, some of the Aws and Khazraj had attempted to imitate. So the rich amongst them had, you know, cheap imitations, but not the real deal. These guys had the real deal. So they have their massive 
fortress that is a uh, protected fortress it's, it's completely you know the Muslims don't have the technology at this level to break it they don't, they'll have to simply lay siege to it so the Prophet ﷺ said perhaps they said something to irritate me or to irritate you about me so he said yes so what did the Prophet ﷺ say he said once they see me they will not be able to say those things and he knew this group that they're saying this behind my back if they see me they can never say this Right? And so he went all the way up and he set his camp right there in front of the fortress. And the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that, uh, O group of the Yahud, didn't Allah humiliate you? How aren't, you? aren't you now humiliated? And hasn't Allah's anger come upon you? Are you now going to admit at least right, that khalas is over now? And they said, Ya Abu Qasim, O Abu Qasim, you were never one who acted foolishly. Meaning, Please have mercy, please spare us. You're never one who acted foolishly, right? You're always a wise man. You're never one who, one who acted uh, foolishly. And so the Prophet ﷺ surrounded them and told them to surrender and they refused. So the siege was set up. And so they camped around the entire fortress. Days turned into weeks. Weeks turned into almost one month. All the books of Sirah pretty much agree that this siege lasted for 25 days and Khandaq most likely lasted for 20 or 25 days. So the entire ordeal and they're literally walking distance from their houses but there's wars going on, right? The entire ordeal almost two months lasted. This is now very tense the situation, right? So uh, for 25 days they are surrounding, now there is no battle or war because there is, there, there can't, I mean this is khalas, they're surrounded, they can't do anything and they're outnumbered as well. Uh, by a factor probably two to one. So it wasn't as if it was a massive outnumbering. You have the, the Banu Qurayda, you have the Muslims. And so the Prophet surrounded them. And of course inside are of course Huyay ibn Akhtab. Remember, Huyay the leader of the Banu Nadir, right? Who through his own arrogance and foolishness found himself inside. Right? And of course they have Ka'b uh, ibn Asad who is the leader of the Banu Qurayda. And as the days turned into weeks, uh, Ka'ab said to his people, uh, Oh my people, I suggest one of three choices. Let's do one of three things. Okay? When did this happen? We don't know. Obviously, nobody's going to put a schedule of when this happened, but we can assume sometime towards the end when the situation is getting tense. Ka'ab said, Let's give one of three choices. I give you. Number one, we accept this man's religion. For wallahi, we all know that he is the Prophet. That the one that has been predict predicted in our books. We all know this. I mean, come on, let's, it's an open secret. Now we all know this is the man that has been predicted in our books. And if we do so, then our lives and our property will be safe. Khalas, we'll get off then. If we accept Islam, because Islam forgives everything. Everybody knows this at the time. Islam forgives every sin. So if we accept Islam, then khalas, we are all safe. They said, Wallahi, we will never leave our religion. We're never going to leave the laws and the, uh, the, 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 the Torah. We're never going to leave our religion. Now, interesting here that when they're about to die, basically, he, he says the secret that everybody knew but is too embarrassed to admit. And that is, we all know this is the one. You know, when it's literally towards the end, now he opens up and he says it to his people. We all know. And they didn't deny it, by the way. None of them said, no, no, I still have my doubts. I mean, by now, especially, who can have any doubts? All of the miracles have appeared. Everything is clear. And this really is the worst type of arrogance, which is to know the truth and then still not follow it. This is the worst type of arrogance that is imaginable. So they said, we're never going to give up our deen. So they said, okay, option number two, which is much more gruesome. Option number two is what? Let us kill our own families. And then charge outside with our swords drawn until one of us two is eliminated. And if we die, then khalas, we have left nothing to worry about. And if we win, there are plenty of women that we can marry afterwards. So the second option is... Kamikaze. <laughs> Kamikaze, okay. Yes, in a, in, a, in a way, yes, exactly. The second option is this. Get rid of our own family so that we don't have to worry about what's going to happen to them. We are going to do this job. And then we just unsheathe our swords and barge out. Khalas last man and, and it was 
a far shot chance, but it was possible. The, they're outnumbered one to two, max one to three. It's not as if the odds are completely impossible, right? So we say, khalas, let's do this. And of course, I mean, there's no way this is going to happen. So they say, we're not going to kill uh, our own family. Obviously, they're this. I mean, it's understood they're not going to do that. Uh, and so, khalas, they turned that option down. And so the third option uh, he said was, Okay, if you refuse the first two, then the only option we have is we surprise attack them. And the only day that will be a surprise is the day of Sabbath, which is our surprise, basically. <laughs> they wouldn't be expecting us to break our own Sabbath, right? So let's attack on our Sabbath so that they are not expecting it. So we have the advantage of the Sabbath uh, in attacking them. And, of course, his people said... Uh, that we will never break the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. Don't you know that if we do this, Allah will send a punishment and whatnot upon us? This is to, to them, that's the number one law, you know, not even following the process, but breaking the laws of the Sabbath. And so they refused to do this. And uh, Ka'ab got so angry at them, he said, uh, as Ibn Ishaq says, he says, Wallahi, since the day your mothers have given birth to you, none of us has ever made up one decision in their lives. Right? You're so indecisive, you can't make up anything. I'm giving you three options, and you refuse. Uh, all of them. Then they sent uh, Shas ibn Qais as a messenger to the Prophet one of their one of their own, and he begged and he pleaded and he said, "O oh Muhammad sallam, give to us what you gave to the Banu Nadir, which was the Banu Nadir were leave your properties uh, and take your families and whatever the camels can carry, right? This was what had happened to the Banu Nadir. Give us that condition and okay, we're happy. Okay, you can take our properties and possessions, but." Uh, sorry, our lands, not our properties, our lands, and we'll take the money. And we'll take the camels, we'll take the families, and we will go. Uh, the Prophet said, no. Comes back with the second offer. Khalas, keep the camels and the property. Just save us. Now they know, they understand, we said this many weeks now, they know exactly what they're in for, right? Let us go with our families, okay? Keep all of the properties. And the Prophet said, no, only an unconditional surrender. I will not accept anything less than an unconditional surrender. And this shows us, by the way, and I've said this again for the last five weeks, treachery and lying is never allowed. I mean, we know they're going to die. We know, the, but he did not give them a false promise and then got them out and then did it. No. Because you're not allowed to be treacherous and treasonous. You're not allowed to be double-faced double, uh, double, uh, about this. They wanted a condition, he could have said, okay, khalas, yes, and then when they come out, do whatever he wanted. But no, he's a man of his word, and treachery is not allowed in any circumstance. And he said, no, only an unconditional surrender. So, Shaz goes, uh, goes back, and then comes again, uh, him or somebody else, and he says that we want Abu Lubaba to come inside our fortress. Send for Abu Lubaba. So the Prophet said, Khalas, go Abu Lubaba, go. Now who is Abu Lubaba? Abu Lubaba is one of the Aus, and the uh, Banu Quraidha had the alliance with the Aus. The Banu Quraidha had that treaty with the Aus, just like the Banu Nadir had with the Khazraj. So the, uh, the, the Aus are very friendly. They were very friendly. They were the Hulafa, they were the allies of the Banu Nadir, uh, the, uh, the Banu Quraidha in the days of Jahiliyyah, the Banu Quraidha in the days of Jahiliyyah. And Abu Lubaba especially was a close confidant and friend in the days of Jahiliyyah. Right? So he was one of those whom they knew very well. He would visit their, their, their uh, fortress, he would uh, drink with them. It was a friendship that lasted for many years. So they said, call Abu Lubaba. Out of all of the people of Medina, they were the closest to him. So Abu Lubaba went in. And uh, Abu Lubaba, of course, he is a great Sahabi. He has uh, witnessed Badr in that he was technically in the army, but the Prophet ﷺ sent him to do an errand. So he didn't actually fight at Badr. But because he had wanted to participate, he got a share of Badr and he's written amongst the Badriyun. So he's technically a Badri. And he's also participated in Uhud and he participated in other battles and he has a good record. But this was a slip that was about to happen. This was a slip that was about to happen, a human slip. A human slip that really comes from uh, you know, the friendship and compassion that he had with them in the days of uh, Jahili, in the days of Islam. So he entered their fortress. And Ibn Ishaq says he was surrounded by the people. They're all like uh, so happy to see him and also grieved. And, and, and remember, this is now a siege. Probably we're talking about the 20th or 23rd day, very close to the end. You can imagine how tense they must be. And the women and children began crying and begging for mercy from him as if he's going to do anything, right? And so... Ibn Ishaq says his heart became soft for them. Because they were friends in the day. 
His heart became soft for them. And they said, what do you think? Should we surrender or not? They're asking him, should we surrender or not? And so Abu Lubaba said, yes, you should. But then he made a motion like this. Meaning, you're going to have to surrender. But, he said, as soon as I said this, this is Abu Lubaba speaking, as soon as I said this, Wallahi, my feet had not moved from my place, except that I realized I had been treacherous to Allah and His Messenger. I am disloyal to Allah and His Messenger. This is khiyana. This is um, uh, khiyana to Allah. I mean, meaning that I, I, I am showing them something that firstly he wasn't 100% sure about because the Prophet didn't say this, right? But secondly, whose side is he on? After all that has happened, whose side is he on? This is a matter, uh, we call it really of wala and bara, and that is uh, loyalties. Whose loyalty do you have? Is it Allah and His Messenger or is it the Banu Qurayla? And to show sympathy in such a tense situation to the enemy, after all that they have done, this is what the khiyana really was, right? And so he said, I hadn't even moved from my feet, my feet hadn't moved, excuse me, except that I knew that I had betrayed Allah and His Messenger, and uh, he says that he left the fortress bypassing the army, bypassing the process, and he just went away. And he went immediately to the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, and he tied himself to one of the pillars, which is called the pillar of Abu Lubaba, or the pillar of repentance, it is called. And if you go to the masjid, which inshallah, inshallah in two weeks we'll be there inshallah, for those of us who are going, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will show you, I will show you this pillar, and it actually has on it the pillar of tawbah. And inshallah remember this story then, this is the pillar of tawbah, still we know where it is. Right? Abu Lubaba tied himself to this pillar and he said that Wallahi, I shall remain tied to this pillar until Allah accepts my repentance and I shall never venture to the Banu Qurayla again for I will never be in an area where I disobeyed Allah and His Messenger which shows us even the area where you disobey Allah and His Messenger you should avoid it. Right? I don't want to be in that land where I disobeyed Allah and His Messenger. Now, he didn't come out from the Prophet's perspective, he didn't see him. After a while he asked, what happened to Abu Lubaba? Eventually the news spreads, they find out he's tied himself to the masjid, they come back and they tell the Prophet ﷺ what has happened. So he said, if he had come to me, I would have asked Allah to forgive him. But now that he has done this to himself, I can't do anything. Why? Because he's made a promise to Allah's nadr. This is a nadr. That wallahi, I'm not going to give from this place until Allah reveals the tawbah. The Prophet says, I can't do anything. Huh? This is a nadr and... Yufuna bin Nadr, Allah says in the Quran, they fulfill their nadr. And he made another. And once you make another, if you say, Wallahi, I'm gonna do this and this, and you mean another, well then you are obliged to fulfill the nadr to Allah, basically with conditions that are beyond the scope right now. But yes, you're supposed to fulfill it. So he said, I can't do anything. He made the nadr. And uh, to finish the story of Abu Lubaba, uh, so he's remained tied. Allah knows for how long, probably more than a week. He remained tied to this uh, post. Uh, and uh, after the incident had all finished and the Prophet returned, one day at Fajr, uh, one day at Fajr, the Prophet woke up to go pray in the masjid and he was laughing. And Umm Salama said, uh, Ma adhakaka ya Rasulullah, what has caused you to laugh? Adhakallahu sinnak, which is a very good expression in Arabic, uh, which translates as, may you ever be laughing as long as you live. It's a good expression in Arabic that, you know, it's some, uh, you know, may you always be happy. You know, adhakallahu sinnak. Uh, and so, what has caused you to laugh at this time in the early morning? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has accepted the tawbah of Abu Lubaba. So, uh, Umm Salama said, should I not go out and tell him? Because Umm Salama's house was right connected to Aisha's. Uh, and at that stage, at that stage, Umm Salama's house did have a direct door. Later on, all these doors were shut except for the door of Aisha. But at that stage, Umm Salama's door also had a direct access to the masjid. So she said, should I not go out and tell uh, Abu Lubaba, and this was before hijab had been revealed as well. So there is no concept of hijab at this point in time. And so the Prophet said, yes, if you want. So uh, Umm Salama comes rushing out and she says to Abu Lubaba that uh, Abshir, uh, thank Allah or be happy. Allah has accepted your repentance. And all of the Sahaba who are waiting for Fajr, they go and uh, they want to unleash, uh, uh, release him you know, from the sh chains and shackles. And he said, no until the Prophet ﷺ comes and he unties me himself. To be sure that Allah has accepted my tawbah. 
to be sure that there's nothing left until the Prophet ﷺ comes and unties me himself. And so the Prophet ﷺ, before praying Fajr, he went and untied Abu Lubaba with his own hands and then uh, uh, led the Salat al-Fajr. And this is the famous story of Abu Lubaba. And it is said that two verses were revealed because of Abu Lubaba. The first is Surah Anfal, verse 27. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَخُونُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ وَتَخُونُوا أَمَانَاتِكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ O you who believe, do not betray the trust of Allah and the Messenger, and betray your own trust as a Muslim. While you know, you're not supposed to do this. Don't, don't betray the trust of Allah and His Messenger. One, one riwayah says this was revealed because of Abu Lubaba. And then the repentance of Abu Lubaba is Surah Tawbah verse 102. Surah Tawbah verse 102, uh, which uh, says, وَآخَرِينَ اَعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ خَلَطُوا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَآخَرَ سَيِّئًا عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ And there are others amongst the Sahaba, وآخرين. اعترفوا بذنوبهم. By the way, Hassan al-Basri and other Sahaba used to say, this verse is the most optimistic verse in the whole Quran for me. This verse is the most optimistic verse. Memorize it, pay attention to it. وَآخَرِينَ There are others amongst them, not as elite as the ones that have gone by. There's a lower level now. وَآخَرِينَ اِعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ They recognize their sins. They admitted they have done sins. اِعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ خَلَطُوا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَآخَرَ سَيِّئًا They have mixed up good deeds and bad deeds. They've mixed them up. They have some good and they have some bad. عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ اللَّهُمَ جَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ يَا رَبِّ May Allah, uh, عَسَى اللَّهُ, Allah might forgive them. عَسَى اللَّهُ And Ibn Abbas said every time Allah says عَسَى, He will do it. عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah might forgive them. Uh, and Allah غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So, uh, Abu Lubaba, was, it was revealed because of him. He has so many good deeds. He has Badr, he has Uhud, he has this. And then he fell into some wrong things as well. اِخْتَلَطُوا They have mixed up good and bad. Allah will forgive them, insha'Allah ta'ala. Hassan al-Basri said that this is arja ayat in fi kitabillah, the most optimistic verse in the book of Allah. Because, insha'Allah, all of us, يعني, we have no doubt evil, but insha'Allah we've also done some good, insha'Allah. So we are of those, insha'Allah, that we acknowledge, i'tarafu bidun, that's the key. We acknowledge we are sinful, and we have mixed up the good and bad deeds. May Allah forgive us. In any case, this is Abu Lubaba. Now we get back to the story where Abu Lubaba left off when he exited the fortress. So, 24 days have gone. The next day is going to be the 25th day. The very last night now. And apparently they decide that, khalas, we don't have any option, we're going to surrender. We're inferring this because of what happens now. Uh, they decide they're going to surrender. Now, they couldn't have lasted forever. How long? The supplies are going to cut off. There's no escape. All of the Muslims are surrounded. The, the fortress, there really is nothing they can do. The process is adamant, unconditional surrender. Khalas, unconditional. What can they do then? There's no alternative. Let's just move on then. And so, the night of the 24th, very minor incident, but it's still very interesting. Uh, that in the middle of the night, uh, of course, the guards are surrounding the fortress, the Muslim army, I should say. They're surrounding, you know, the fortress. So, they hear somebody come outside. The sentry says, who is it? So, the man says, Amr ibn Sa'da, Amr ibn Sa'da. And one of the sentry, one of the Muslims who were standing there was Muhammad ibn Maslama, the famous Sahabi Muhammad ibn Maslama. And he recognized who is this Amr. Who was this Amr? Amr was one of perhaps two or maybe even the only out of the Banu Quraida who had vocally refused to follow what Ka'b ibn Malik had done. Ka'b ibn Asad, excuse me. Ka'b ibn Asad had done. And he said, I will never betray Muhammad He's a Yahudi, he hasn't accepted Islam. I will never betray the promise. And he vocally opposed his people. So he wasn't happy with what they had done, but he's in the fortress, that's, his, his, that's where he's living. Right? Now, we're assuming this, this is what this is not mentioned. When he hears they're going to surrender the next day, he wants to just try his qadr to get out. Because he's not... He doesn't feel a part of his people anymore. And he's opposed them because of this issue. So he leaves, he leaves uh, uh, the, the people. And uh, he was the only one, or maybe there was one more, there's an ikhtilaf, how many? But one of the very few, perhaps definitely the main one, who had expressed his opposition to what his people have done. Now this is very important. <coughs> because he's with them, but he's not with them, right? You get the point here. So Muhammad, now it's the middle of the night. Muhammad ibn Maslam basically has to make a decision now. Do we kill him? Do we imprison him? Do we take him to the Prophet And so he basically says a very eloquent phrase which translates into simple English as, uh, Oh Allah, 
overlook my overlooking of him. Just forgive me for forgiving him, basically. Like he has a soft spot for what he's done. Now you're trying to leave, so he simply let him go. He didn't do anything. He let him go. And uh, it is said that he made his way to Medina, spent the night in Medina, and the next morning he just disappeared. And Allah knows, nobody knows what his end was. He just left the city. And when the Prophet ﷺ found out about what happened, he said, that was a man whom Allah saved because of his honesty. That was a man whom Allah saved because he fulfilled his part of the bargain. Meaning, okay, he didn't convert, but he didn't want his people to do what he did. And so, Allah made a way out for him. He didn't, the Prophet did not get angry at Muhammad ibn Maslam. Right? Then he said, okay, he did what he did, and Allah saved him because he was a man who wanted to fulfill the treaty. So, look, and this shows us, this is the key point here. We're going to go back to this over and over at the end of today, that these people were punished for what they did and not who they were and this incident is one of those many indications he did not convert he remained upon the religion of the Banu Qurayza right but even the Prophet remarked this is a little gift Allah gave him because he was true to his covenant he was faithful so Allah saved him because of his honesty the next morning the message came that they're willing to surrender khalas they're willing to surrender now the message has come they are all inside the fortress. They're all inside the fortress, right? So immediately, the Aus, who of course are the Hulafa, the, the allies of the uh, Banu Quraida, the Aus surround the Prophet ﷺ. They began pleading. Because as of yet, the Prophet ﷺ has not said what he's going to do. Now, Abu Lubaba and others have understood what he wants to be done, right? But he hasn't said it. And because he hasn't said it, the Aus, remember their days of Jahiliya, their transactions, their friendships, there's whatnot, and they start begging and pleading with the Prophet ﷺ that spare them. And one of them says, Ya Rasulullah, you spared the Khazraj's tribe, spare our tribe as well, which is the Khazraj's tribe. The Banu Nadir, right? The Banu Nadir, you spared them, right? And the other one, the before, uh, the Banu Nadir and Qaynuqa before them. The Banu Nadir was the recent ones. It just happened recently. You just spared the Banu Nadir and you did it for, who did he do it for? Uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul. Remember Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul kept on begging him from the Khazraj. He's from the Khazraj, right? And the Prophet said, Hum lak, khalas, you, I give them to you. Okay, with the conditions you wanted basically, right? Which was what? Let them take their money and their properties and as much as their camels can carry. Remember they took even their doors. So he gave them that. So now the Aus are feeling what? We deserve the same treatment for our group. But subhanAllah, there's a world of a difference between what the Banu Nadir did and what the Banu Qurayza did. There's a world of a difference, right? But the Aus, I mean, they are humans as well and they want mercy for their own friends that they had. So they're begging, they're pleading what to be done. And so the Prophet wasallam said that uh, will you be happy if one of your own decides their fate? Will this do enough if one of your own decides their fate? They said, of course, Bala ya Rasulullah. So he said, Thaka Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. I have chosen for you Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, your leader, your own leader. Khalas. So I'm not going to decide anymore. Now, wallahi, this is, what can we say? The Messenger of Allah stepping down from his prerogative to give the ruling and saying, you guys decide. This is, I mean, what can we say? Even though he knows that if he said it, they would do it. But he's a leader and the leader has to gain his followers and not impose himself on it. Even if he's Rasulullah there's a hikmah in dealing with your own people. And so he says to them, Khalas, your leader, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, it will be his verdict. Right? And this is just an amazing, amazing facet of the seerah that he's willing to step down and allow Sa'd ibn Mu'adh to judge in a judgment that is really the right of Allah and the right of the Messenger. But he's willingly said, he's willingly compromised, he's willingly said, okay, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh is able to judge. Now, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, of course, he's been dealt that death wound, remember, right? His entire, the deep artery has been cut right over here. There is no healing. And Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, up until this point, 25 days have gone by. He is still in the tent that was literally the hospital tent that they had. Literally, it was like a clinic tent. And uh, there was a, this is a side point here, uh, that 
uh, there was the equivalent of a nurse amongst the Sahaba, and her name was Rufayda, with a dal, Rufayda. And Rufayda, Ibn Ishaq says, she was the volunteer always to take care of the wounded and to deal with the sick. This was her job, which is a nurse, basically, right? She had volunteered to be that nurse. Rufayda was her name, and she had a tent. That was the tent of the sick. It's basically a hospital of our times, right? And she's the nurse that's cleaning the wound and taking care of their needs and giving them food and water and voluntary. She's doing this fee sabilillah, right? So she, he was in the tent of Rufayda still. He was in the tent of Rufayda still bleeding. 25 days non-stop bleeding. Can you, I mean, you know, the wound is not going to heal. He's going to die soon. And so a group of the Banu Salama became very happy. They rushed back to Medina and they said, the Prophet is calling you and you're about to judge between uh, uh, you know, the Banu Qurayla. And uh, they put him on a mule and, they, uh, and he was bandaged and he's still bandaged and the wound is still uh, bleeding. And so he is slowly taken all the way to the tribe or the, the, the area of the Banu Qurayla. And... Uh, on the way there, when he was uh, walking, the Aus surrounded him, the ones that were with him. And they continued to tell him, you have to be merciful, reminding him of the days of Jahiliyyah. Remember this, and they did this, and we did that, and this, that. And one of them said that you have only been chosen by the Prophet because you're going to be merciful. That's why he chose you. right? And so he said, when this was said to him, he said that now is the time for Sa'd. To not care about the criticism of any critic when it comes to Allah and His Messenger. Now is the time. Now His own people, all of them, were hoping for a verdict. And Sa'ad says, now is the time, meaning I'm about to die. If I'm not going to be faithful now, when is there going to be a faithful time? And subhanAllah, compare this with even Abu Talib or anybody else at their deathbed, right? Compare this with anyone else that at the end of their lives, people want to go out with a bang for their people, right? They want to leave the legacy. People will speak about me in this manner, right? What did Sa'ad say? Now is the time I really should not care about what people think. It is the time to be sincere to Allah and His Messenger. When he said this... It was understood by the Aus which way Sa'ad is heading. And some of them immediately understood that khalas, he has not, he's not going to do what we want him to do. And when he came to the Banu Qurayda and the Prophet saw him being escorted on the uh, mule, uh, he said to the Ansar, Qumu uh, ila Sayyidikum, stand up to greet your leader. And there's not a single person in the history of the seerah that the Prophet ﷺ ordered others to stand up to greet. He himself would not allow the Sahaba to stand up when he walked into a room. And this, by the way, leads to another huge controversy in fiqh, which we don't have time to get into, about should you stand when somebody comes or not. There's a huge controversy in fiqh. And again, it goes back to Banu Qurayda and Sa'ad. And it goes back to the Prophet himself not wanting the Sahaba to stand up. There seems to be a bit of a tension because the Prophet said, Hadith is authentic. Whoever loves it that people stand up for him, let him be prepared to sit down in the fire of hell. Whoever is, loves it that people always stand up for him, then let him be prepared for his seating place in Jahannam. Now he said this and yet he is telling the Ansar, Qumu ila Sayyidikum. Stand, and the hadith is Mutafaq Ali, Bukhari and Muslim. Stand up to greet your leader. How do you reconcile? Long story, but inshallah, the correct position, Imam al Nawi and others, they say. Whoever has taken this as a habit for himself and he loves that people do it, then this is what the hadith applies to. Right? Nobody should expect others to stand up when he enters a room. Everybody in the room stands up. This is not the way of, uh, of Islam. But once in a while, if a respected elder comes back from a journey or whatnot, and we stand up to greet him a one-off, not as a regular habit, then this is something that is ja'iz and mustahab, right? So, it is authentically narrated that the Prophet uh, when uh, uh, Fatima came to uh, uh, see him after a, a while that she had been away, and she came, to re she came to greet him, he stood up to kiss his own daughter. He stood up, he was so happy to see her. And again, he's standing up out of happiness to see her, right? So, uh, it is permissible, ja'iz, to stand up one-off, once in a while, 
and not as a regular habit and custom that when somebody enters and then uh, he expects everybody to stand up, this is not something that we approve of uh, uh, as a custom and as a tradition. Uh, but if a grandfather comes, if you know a guest comes, you know to your house and you stand up to go greet him, this is like you're standing up to welcome him. Were he to enter the masjid, you would not stand up for him. Were you in somebody else's house? So, you know, this is not, you're not standing up for his sake. You're standing up to greet him as a one-off. So, this is something that is, anyway, I didn't want to get into that. That's just a fifth point. Back to where we were. Qumu ila sayyidikum. Stand up for your uh, leader. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh that your people have chosen you or have accepted you as a judge for ha'ula'i, for these. Meaning, for the Banu Quraidha. Your people have accepted your judgment uh, for these people. Now, the Banu Quraidha are still inside the fortress, right? All of this is taking place and the Banu Quraidha are away from the scene. It's between the, uh, the not even all of the Sahabas, really between the Aus and the Prophet The Muhajirun and the Khazraj, really, they're not as involved. Of course, the Muhajirun, you know, there's nothing to do with this tribe anyway. And the Khazraj, they had animosity with them. From the days of Jahl. Remember, that's the point here. The Khazraj had animosity with this tribe and the Aus had animosity with the Banu Nadir. So frankly, the Khazraj would not be cared at all if the, the verdict was given against them. They have no sympathy for them. It's the Aus that had the sympathy for them. So, uh, it's really between the Aus and the process. A little bit of, you know, call it tension, but even tension maybe is too harsh, but a little bit of difference of opinion about what to be done. So he says to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, your people have chosen you. So, Sa'ad says to his people, I, I, I call you to Allah, I, I, I tell you to make a promise with Allah. Will you listen and obey me if I give the verdict? Are you now content that once I give the verdict, end of story? You're not going to argue, you're not going to debate. And so they said yes, that's why we're happy, yes it is you. And he then, subhanAllah, what a beautiful incident here. He turned to the Prophet and out of respect he lowered his face in front of him and he said and you as well and he cannot just say directly to the process he lowered his face because he cannot look up to him and speak to him like this and say and you as well ya rasulullah you are also content that this is going to be you know uh, whatever i say will be the final verdict and khalas no criticism afterwards right and the process said yes we have agreed wallahi is just mind boggling to imagine that the prophet sallam Yani, what can we say? Wallahi, I mean, this is a leader, isn't it? You know, the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is willing to go down to the ruling of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh just because of the Aus's sensibilities. He said, "Yes, whatever you decide, it will be done." And so Sa'd immediately, without a second's hesitation, he has been thinking about this verdict from the last 30, 40 days. He has nothing he has to be any decision about. Instantaneously he says, Hukmi fihim, my judgment is them, in them, is that their men should be executed, and their property distributed, and their women and children be taken captive. Instantaneous verdict. This is what needs to be done. Their men to be executed, their property distributed, and their women and children taken as captive. And as soon as he says this, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi, ya Sa'ad, you have decreed upon them the qadaullahi ta'ala min fawqi sab'i samawat. This was the judgment of Allah from above the seven heavens. He didn't want to say it, the Prophet ﷺ, because of the aus. So he let them basically do it this way. But when Sa'ad said it, this was the decree of Allah that you have done. And by the way, this shows us Allah's decree is going to be one. There's not multiple decrees. It is one decree. But the Prophet was willing, in this case too, for the sake of un unity of the Ummah, for the sake of ta'lif al qulub yani being gentle with the people, to basically have a softer decree. But when Sa'ad said this, he says, لَقَدْ حَكَمْتَ فِيهِمْ بِحُكْمِ اللَّهِ This is the hukum of Allah. مِنْ فَوْقِ سَبْعِ samawat. Literally. مِنْ فَوْقِ سَبْعِ samawat is one of the phrases in the hadith uh, as well. And when uh, this verdict was given, then of course the commandment was given to perform these, uh, these uh, executions and the men were all uh, tied up and they were led to an area of the, uh, one of the ladies of the Banu Najjar owned a vast area and uh, trenches were dug and the books of Sira mentioned that all of the male adults were basically taken uh, batches by batches and they were executed. This is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. And one of the young uh, men who survived, Atiyah al quradi uh, he narrates that I was a sabi, I was a boy that was spared that day because I didn't have hair. 
which means the adults were the ones that were executed, and the young were, and the and the women were of course uh, spared. And uh, it is mentioned a, num a number of stories here. Huyay ibn Akhtab, this leader of the Banu Nadir, Huyay ibn Akhtab, when he was led out of the fortress, he was wearing his finest garment, a red silk embroidery. He had worn his finest garment, and he had used strings to tie it around his body because he didn't want anybody to take it from his body after his death. He wanted to use that till his death, right? And when he passed by the process and being led to the execution, he looked at him and said, Wallahi, I have never regretted my animosity and enmity towards you. Yani to the last, as they say, Ma nadimtu. I have no regrets that I have shown animosity to you. And then he said a phrase that we seek Allah's refuge from, because it is a true phrase. But whoever Allah humiliates, that is the real one who is humiliated. We seek Allah's refuge from Khidlanullah. But look, the guy realizes. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, deep down inside, he knows whose side Allah is on. And so he says, whomever Allah has humiliated, that is the one who is truly humiliated. And he then turned to his people that were left and he said, Oh my people, don't be sad because this is the decree and calamity that Allah has decreed upon the Bani Israel, meaning this is going to happen to us and this has been happening to us and will continue to happen to us, meaning yani, the punishments that Allah himself says in the Quran. And then he lowered his neck and was executed. And Ka'ab ibn Asad, when he was brought out, Ka'ab ibn Asad was more, always more repentant, more, you know, he wasn't as arrogant. He had to be convinced, right? Remember, the leader of the Banu Quraid, they had to be convinced. When Ka'ab ibn Asr was let out, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Oh Ka'ab, why didn't you benefit from the advice of Ibn Kharrash? Now I did my quick searches about Ibn Kharrash and I went here and there about the books of the seerah. I couldn't find anything today, uh, but I'll try to continue looking up. But from the context, it appears that Ibn Kharrash was one of their rabbis that had died before the coming of the Prophet and he had predicted the coming of the Prophet So he said to Ka'ab, why didn't you benefit from Ibn Kharrash? For he believed in me and commanded you to follow me and gave his salams to me through you if you saw me. The only, the only thing to understand then, he was one of the rabbis who had predicted the coming of a prophet. And the Prophet is saying, it's obvious I am that prophet. Why didn't you benefit from the advice of Ibn Kharrash? So Ka'ab says, I swear by the Torah, Ya Abu Al-Qasim, that this is true. He did tell us this. I swear by Allah, he did tell us this. And were it not for the fact that the Yehud would criticize me and say that because I was scared of death, I converted. I would have followed you even now. But I die upon the faith of the Yehud. Once again, to the very end, still better than the previous, but he is going to die upon the faith of his people. And there were no <coughs> uh, children killed. And as for the woman, there was only one woman who was killed out of all of the women. And Aisha narrates her story that Aisha says, I was sitting with the prisoners and a lady uh, of the prisoners was uh, laughing and joking with me. The all types of jokes, even as her people were being executed. And I was amazed at her, like her attitude, what is going on? Uh, until somebody called her name, we don't know her name. Somebody called her name and she stood up. So I said, where? Why is he calling? So she said, to be killed. So Aisha says, why? She says, I have done something. She knew that it was her death. I have done something. And later on, we find out that uh, she, in the siege or the, 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 the siege for 25 days, she had killed one of the Sahaba by throwing uh, a grinding stone. You know, the stone that you grind the, uh, the, the wheat and whatnot from. She had taken it to the top and she waited for somebody to pass and she threw it. And so it killed a certain Sahabi. His name is mentioned. And so because she murdered or she killed him in this manner, so uh, when the fortress was conquered, so she was the only one that was executed. Uh, and Aisha says that I, I never cease to be amazed at her laughing and her attitude. And then knowing 
that she was going to face death. Now this is a type of, uh, you know, um, when you get to this, it's, she gets a bit hy hysteria, really. I mean, you kind of lose it, right? That Aisha says she knew she was going to, well, I mean, Aisha didn't say this, but Aisha says, I never cease to be amazed at her attitude. And then what happened? I think in modern science, we can kind of figure out this is a type of, you know, uh, paranoia is the term, or what would you call it besides hysteria? I mean, she went, she went a little bit hysterical or whatever, you know, shock or whatever. And she knew she's going to happen, so she's cracking jokes at the time of death, knowing she's about to die. And while her people are being killed, and then uh, she is the only one that, um, uh, amongst the women that are killed. And there are a number of other stories. An interesting story that is narrated is that of uh, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas. One of the Ansar, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, he has a story, and that is that in the wars of Bu'ath, what are the wars of Bu'ath? Who can remind me? So when did it finish, the wars of Bu'ath? Right before the Hijrah by two years, three years. The wars of Bu'ath were the wars between the Aus and the Khazraj and between the Banu Qaynuqa and the Banu Nadir and uh, the Banu Qurayza, right? So in the wars of Bu'ath, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, he was saved, his life was saved by one of the uh, Banu Qurayza. His name is Zubayr ibn Batta. Zubayr ibn Batta. So this is a Quradi. He had saved Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas. So uh, Thabit then went to the prisoners, he found uh, Zubair and he said, Oh Zubair, do you remember me? And Zubair said, of course I remember you, you're the one that I saved, this and that. So he said that uh, it is time for me to repay that favor. Do you wish me to repay that favor? And he said, of course, a generosity uh, from a generous person will always be appreciated. Yeah, I mean, he's about to die, of course. And it is said Zubair had now become extremely old by this time. He's, you know, uh, uh, white-haired, he's a very old man. So, he, uh, Thabit goes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, please give me uh, Zubair. Allow Zubair to be, to, to be spared. So the Prophet said, he is for you. Okay, khalas, he's for you. So he goes back to uh, Zubair. And Zubair says, of what use is life without family? So he goes back to the Prophet and begs for family and children. He says, khalas, they're for you. So his wife and his children are spared. So then he says what? Money. Money. Right? <laughs> of what use is life without money? money right? And okay, I need, I need my position. So, back to the process. And what do you think? Khalas for you as well. Subhanallah, right? Then, now listen to the, uh, the twist at the end, right? Then Zubair says, uh, where is so-and-so? He mentions somebody. He's been killed. Where is so-and-so? He's been killed. Where is so? He mentions his own. Or he's about to be killed, right? When he realizes that he's going to be the only one of his tribe basically left, right? Or one of the few, there were only a few that actually uh, did survive. Uh, he then said, what is the purpose of life without Ahbab? Without friends and tribe? And so, you send me to my death instead of somebody else. That was what he wanted, right? So he didn't accept any of this and he in fact was... Uh, killed because of this. He was killed because he said, uh, he was about, he was an old man, and he said, what's the point of living now? Khalas, just you take care of this. So, uh, it was done. Um, also, one or two others survived. It is said that some of the, uh, some of the uh, Banu, uh, the Banu uh, Nadir, sorry, some of the Banu Quraidah, uh, some of them had converted to Islam, and so they were spared. Uh, anybody who had converted to Islam, they were spared. And also it is said one or two, maybe maximum four or five shafa'as were done, just like this, right? Uh, there's only one or two that are mentioned and perhaps a few others were done. But this also shows any Muslim who had a very special favor about, upon another, they were actually allowed to, uh, they were allowed to take one or two people that they had a special favor. We just give an example that he owes his life to them after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was allowed to take that favor back. It was Zubair's decision. He didn't want it. But the Prophet gave that to him and to one or two others in the same uh, story. Now, how many people were killed? The books of Sirah and Hadith mention v v v uh, broad varying numbers. Ibn Ishaq, who is the most authoritative, says between six to seven hundred. And then he says, but some have exaggerated and said eight to nine. Some have exaggerated the number. Mukthirin, they have made it much more. And there's eight to nine. And this is basically the range he gives. Hadith, one of the hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad mentions around 400. Right? Allah knows best. And whatever it is, it is not a small number. There is no question. It's a large number. This is the entire adult tribe of uh, the uh, Banu Quraidah. 
Uh, so Allah knows 400, 600, 800, max say 900. Allah knows best. And much booty was received. Uh, according to one uh, of the uh, sources, 1,500 swords and 1,500 shields. This is an immense benefit to the Muslim Ummah at the time. 1,500 swords. Swords and shields were not easy to have and they go down generation to generation. You use them over and over again. 1,500. That's the entire people of Medina. They can have swords and shields now. 2,000 spears. 300 body armor suits. 300. And thousands and thousands of sheep and goats and camels like animals that are there and they also found a large quantity of khamar of alcohol but all of this was destroyed nobody got obviously the distributed alcohol all of the alcohol was destroyed it was at that point in time according to one version that the rules of ghanima were solidified and the one who had a horse was given three shares of the one who was walking right one for his horse and double for him, meaning one for the expenses of the horse. Now in those days, the Muslim army is not composed of paid people. The Muslim army has volunteers, and so you use your own weapons, your own money, your own horse. You have to take care of anybody who has an animal, you take care of it, right? So when the booty is distributed, you, your animal gets a share of the booty. Not meaning you get the point, the maintenance fees, right? So the owner of animals got three shares and the one who had no animal, one share. So the three shares, one for the animal, and two for a double for the, the person, because he's risking more. He's risking the animal when he comes in. He has more uh, of a responsibility, so he gets uh, uh, three shares in this regard. And one-fifth of this entire amount was given to the Islamic State and the Prophet as per the rules of Surah Anfal. And there's a footnote here, which we'll come back to, inshallah, towards the end of the seerah, that amongst those whom the Prophet received in this uh, battle was Rayhana, was one of the female captives, Rayhana. And uh, Rayhana, uh, the Prophet invited her to Islam, and initially she refused and she remained upon her religion. And so eventually uh, the Prophet decided to transfer ownership away because he did not uh, uh, want to keep somebody uh, that was not a Muslim. And so uh, he let her for a long time to decide her fate. And then eventually when she realized that the Prophet was going to leave her, uh, and she is a slave, she decided to convert to Islam. Right? So this shows us that uh, the way that the Prophet was treating her and the gentleness, she would rather remain with him than be given to somebody else, even though it was the Muslims who in fact did what they did to their, her own people. But still in the end she realized being with the Prophet would be better for her, so she converted to Islam. When she converted to Islam, the Prophet did what he did with all of his wives that were of this nature and he said, I will free you and marry you and your freedom will be the, the, the mahr. Right? Now the books of Sirah differ. Quite a lot of books say that she willingly did not want this and she wanted to remain uh, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Mulk al Yameen. She wanted to remain Mulk al Yameen and she did not want to be, uh, become a wife. And she said, This is better for me and for you. Why this is the case, there are interpretations. Uh, and then one small minority group says that no, she accepted the offer and she became a wife. So we'll talk about the wives of the Prophet in an entire number of episodes way towards the end, whenever Allah blesses us to get there. And we'll realize, contrary to popular perception, in fact, we have a lot of difference of opinion about how many wives the Prophet had. And the common figure that everybody knows is but one opinion. And this is another issue, for example, Rayhana, we really don't know. And there is nothing conclusive. And the majority say, and the muhaqqiqun, those who are well researchers, they say, Rayhana, she accepted Islam, but she refused to become free. She'd rather remain, uh, uh, she wanted to remain a slave, even though the Prophet gave her the choice. So, uh, in any case, uh, that's another uh, issue. Um, and uh, the uh, final issue that we'll discuss, a little bit late, delayed today, but uh, the final issue that we'll discuss, obviously, and that is, uh, how this incident has been interpreted. It is understood that this is an incident that is politically uh, something that has uh, been smeared and been uh, used in a very negative manner. We don't need to even mention this. It's pretty obvious that uh, the group that has been killed, uh, obviously there are those that charge uh, the Prophet of Islam with being a astaghfirullah anti-Semitic, with uh, you know calling for uh, killings of, of uh, that ethnicity or that religion, etc., etc., and no doubt there is no doubt that the punishment was harsh, 
And even the Prophet was willing to compromise if Sa'ad had agreed, right? That there was a spectrum of opinion. And that there was the possibility of being merciful and there was a possibility of being harsh. But even the most spiteful critic should not and cannot academically say that they were killed because of who they were. Anybody who says this honestly, they just want to say falsehoods. We can understand, even though we as Muslims don't agree, we can understand those who say that was excessively harsh. We can understand. But anybody who says they were killed because of who they were, honestly this is just a flagrant lie. And none of the early scholars of Islam, none of the scholars of Sirah ever even hint at this. They were killed because of what they did. Not because of who they were. And that's, as I said, anybody who says anything other than this, really we have to say that's where we draw the line. So you're just being unfair. This is not academically valid. The Prophet did not do this to, uh, to the Banu Nadir. He didn't do this to Banu Qaynuqa. Uh, and this is something that if you look at the entire circumstance, look at how many times they were told. Three times they were told. One time was literally right before this incident by a few months, the Prophet after the Banu Nadir had been expelled, before he went to the Banu Nadir, Ibn Ishaq says, he went to the Banu Qaynuqa, and he gave them one more opportunity, right? One more opportunity, do you want to remain upon, you're the last one left, right? And they said yes. And the whole story and the circumstance and attempting to attack the women and children. I mean, wallahi, anybody who puts it into perspective now, the problem comes. Anybody who talks about it, the entire Ahzab is cut off. The entire context is just ignored. And they say, oh, he killed 700, he did this, he did that. And no context is given. And this is, wallahi, the average way that is understood. And this is just not fair. You need to put things into context and perspective. And when you do that, a non-Muslim can say that was excessively harsh. They can say that. We as Muslims say, no, it was the hukum Allah, and harshness has its place. By the way, I don't see a problem saying it was harsh, personally. So what? It has to be. It has to be harsh. So, no, but being harsh is not wrong all the time. Sometimes it's good to be harsh, and sometimes it's good to be merciful. I said this many times, the religion of Islam is the perfect religion because gentleness is the rule, but once in a while, you really have to show some severity and harshness. I don't see a problem saying that there was a, an element of harshness that was deserved. The point is, of course, it's deserved. Right? Yes, forgiveness could have been done, but you can't always forgive. You need to show there is a line you cannot cross. And frankly, I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, many Muslim scholars point out Deuteronomy 20 uh, uh, verses 10 to 14. I quote you Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, that when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open the gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. That's peace, by the way, right? If they refuse to make peace and engage in battle, lay siege to that city. This is what happened with the Banu Quraidah. And when the Lord your God delivers it in your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. And as for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take it as plunder for yourselves, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God has given you from your enemies. <laughs> this was their hukum against them. Literally, word for word, letter for letter. Right? And this is literally, write it down, Deuteronomy 20, 10-14. Deuteronomy 20, 10 to 14, it's right there in their books, right? And what the Prophet ﷺ wanted, even though he didn't do it, that's the whole beauty of it, right? Their own allies, and the ones they themselves wanted, they're the ones who did it. And the Prophet ﷺ, yes, he praised it, he said, this is hukmullah ta'ala fihim, right? But he didn't do it. And in the end of the day, yes, he wanted this to be done, but it was the judgment of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh that was uh, executed. And uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, of course, uh, I already mentioned last week, and with this we conclude, I already mentioned last week the blessings of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, and I forgot to mention one or two things. I mentioned many of the blessings of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, and one of the earliest converts, and his beautiful speech at, uh, at uh, Badr, excuse me, right? That beautiful speech that should be written with the ink of gold. It's such a beautiful speech. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, uh, uh, the only person, as I said, that the Prophet commanded others to stand up for. The only person in the seerah, 
Qumu ila Sayyidikum. The stand up for your uh, leader. That uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was that person who, when he was about to die, he made a dua to Allah, allow me to live till that day. And Allah allowed him to live to that day and he died basically a few days after this. Literally, as soon as this was done, khalas, he made a promise to Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal fulfilled that promise. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is mentioned that uh, when they carried his janazah, the Sahaba said, we have never carried anyone lighter than him. And the Prophet said, why should it not be light? For verily, 70,000 angels have come down. They have never come down to this earth except for now. And they are carrying Sa'ad's grave with you. Why, how can it not be light? As if you're carrying air. You're not carrying anything. This is not you carrying Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And our Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad, meaning in the grave when he's about to be buried, Jazakallahu khayran. This is the Prophet ﷺ saying to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. I mean, this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, right? When the Prophet ﷺ is saying to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, Jazakallahu khayran min sayyidi qawmin. That from the leader of the people, you know, you are the leader of the people, Jazakallahu khayran. You have fulfilled your promise to Allah and Allah will fulfill His promise to you. You have done your job and Allah will fulfill His promise to you. And when he was placed in the grave, the Prophet ﷺ was surrounded by all of the Sahaba. Baqi' was full of the Sahaba when he is buried, when he was buried and his face color changed out of sadness and sorrow. And he started saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And the whole Baqi' started saying Subhanallah because when the Prophet was saying it, all of the Muslims are saying Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And then he said, Allahu Akbar. And they said, what Ya Rasulullah, why the change, why the shift? And the Prophet said, and that beautiful hadith, and it's a very powerful hadith, and it's a very scary hadith as well, that this righteous servant, this, this man, for whom the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shook, meaning, uh, as I said last week, either at the anger of his death, or at the happiness of meeting him. وسبعون ألف سبعون and so the, the skies of the heavens have opened up and seventy thousand angels have come down to 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 witness his shahada. What did the Prophet say? لقد ضم ضمة. He has now been squeezed in the grave and then set free. And if anyone were to have been freed from the squeezing of the grave, it would have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And that's why he was saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Then Allahu Akbar, he's now been opened up. And this shows us that, may Allah Azza wa Jal protect all of us, every one of us will face this, that as soon as the body is placed, there is a dhamma. There is a squeeze. It's just a squeeze for the believer and then let go. Right? And this is what our Prophet said. That Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh has just been squeezed, his squeezing. And if anyone had been saved from even this, it would have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh that the Prophet remembered him for so long. We even said when the gift was given to him, the first name that came to mind, the Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh's handkerchief is better than all that I am wearing. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, ibn Ishaq and ibn Sa'ad and others, they say. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was a tall, broad man, fair-skinned in color, handsome, with a full beard. And he died a tragic death, a young death because of this, of this. And he died at the age of 37. He died at the age of 37. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who follow the footsteps of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and be resurrected with the Nabiin and the Siddiqin and Shuhada'i and Salihin. Wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. And with this, inshallah, time is really late. Inshallah, we'll speak afterwards. I need to give some announcements as well. Uh, with this, inshallah, we are finishing, or not finishing, but uh, pausing our seerah. Season finale? <laughs> Season finale. Um, we are pausing our seerah. Next week, I will...